beauty swans welcome back to story time with Emily Neen and happy Sunday so as Sundays are I will read if God is love then don't be a jerk okay there is a difference between knowing the path and walking the path love is the path to Jesus laid out for us I'm going to assume we agree on that and we won't waste a lot of time arguing about it here the book is about the walking about imagining imagining what love should or could look like if we take that mandate seriously about whatever it is that interrupts and derails us along the way it's about the ways a bigger God is going to yield a greater capacity to love more people and about what that stretching will cause us to confront and confess and jettison it's going to be eventually beautiful but not always pleasant along the way it's no fun to face your failures and I speak from a wealth of experience. Throughout my life I've often imagined I was a Christian. I was raised a Christ in a Christian home and I went to a Christian school. After a few meandering spiritual wilderness years as a skeptical but hopeful agnostic, I attended a Christian seminary, became a Christian pastor, and have served in Christian churches for most of the past 25 years of my life. Not enough Christian for you? No problem, I've got more. Along the way, I've read and studied and preached the scriptures extensively, led community Bible studies and student retreats and overseas mission trips, ministered in tiny rural chapels and massive gleaming mega churches. I've crisscrossed the country for the better part of five years, sharing the good news as I understand it. I've done all of the religious stuff that proper Christians are supposed to do. As a result of these decades immersed in this tradition both personally and vocationally, I thought that I at least had the gist, the gist of Jesus, that I was in the blessed ballpark. Now I think that I might have been doing this wrong all these years. Maybe I assumed something that I shouldn't have because much of the time I don't quite feel like I fit in the places prophets, Jesus folk, gather. I thought Christians I always thought Christians were supposed to care about people, not necessarily agree with them or believe what they believe or even like them, but to see them each as specific and unique image bearers of the divine and want to want to work for shalom for them. Wholeness, happiness, peace, safety, rest, regardless of where they came from or what they believed or who they loved. I grew up believing that one of the markers of a life that emulated Jesus was a pliable heart capable of being broken at the distress of other human beings when they are hungry and hurting, when they are homeless and afraid, when they grieve and feel alone, when they believe they are unloved and forgotten, when tragedy befalls them, when injustice assails them. These things are supposed to move the needle within us if Jesus is softening our hearts, or at least I imagine so. Even in seasons of defiance and doubt, when I wasn't sure what, that Jesus was who they said he was, or that I believed anything about salvation and damnation, I took that love your neighbor business seriously. In those obstinate backsliding seasons of rebellion, when I was what true disciples call a hopelessly lost ship, I was sure that compassion was non-negotiable non -negotiable for Jesus' followers. I always knew sacrificial love was the narrow road and the better path, that loveless Christianity was an oxymoron, and that if I ever claimed faith, I'd better be more loving than if I didn't. I bet you that, <clears throat> I bet you know all that too, which is why you're in disbelief that so many professed Christians reject, re <clears throat> neglect the one job of loving people and why you're compelled to get it right. We need such human beings walking around now more than ever, if uh, given where we're headed, at least in America. 
I'm writing these words in the last days of a COVID ravaged, racism scarred, election battered 2020 that seems determined to squeeze in every bit of disaster it can before angrily departing into the annals of history, future therapy bills, and the recurring nightmares of everyone who managed to live through it. Here in this current disorienting mal maelstrom of prolonged isolation, wild conspiracy theories, election fraud claims, and other assorted personal and national disasters too lengthy to list here. There are a whole lot of things I don't know. I don't know if I'll spend a second birthday in quarantine. I don't know if my kids will homeschool through college. I don't know if I'll ever get to use my freaking flyer miles. I don't know if uh, before the end of the year Donald Trump is going to declare Mar Lago a foreign, a sovereign nation, and himself its rightful king. But there is one thing about the future I do know right now, one coming reality that I can safely predict with 100% certainty, regardless of who assumes and re or restrain, retains the presidency, who the composition of Congress turns out to be, or whether there is a blow, blue or red majority in America. Loveless, Jesusless Christianity is going to leave us fractured in ways we've never been before. There is going to be a relational collateral damage in families. Faith communities will be broken apart. Lifelong friendships will be irreparably harmed. Injustice will be prevalent and hateful religion will have compounded it all. No political result of November 3rd, 2020 was going to change what was true on the day before or on the day I'm writing these words or on the day you're reading them. The calendar and the politicians are in immaterial. These injuries we're trended to are all far bigger than partition politics or national election results, and they won't be re, re relegated to a single calendar year either. These are evergreen afflictions. For as long as human beings have been declaring devotion to a god of love, they have been gloriously screwing it up by being hateful in the process. The Bible doesn't shy away from that, and neither should we. If we've been paying attention, we know that for as much as religion has been bent the arc of the moral universe towards justice, it has just as often pulled it into inequity. For whatever liberation has come via the people of Jesus, we have collectively engineered bondage and fortified supremacy as well. It's good to admit this as we try to fashion something better from what has been. It's necessary to see the ugly things in the shadowed places of our nation and in our faith tradition as we work to let a little bit of light in. This isn't going to be as easy, as easy or as neat or as comfortable as we'd like. I can understand why you might not want to accept the invitation I'm offering here. Lord literally knows I've avoided it for most of my life. It's a fairly simple and painless task to identify the people out there who we believe are doing religion wrong and condemn them. We can usually accomplish that with very little effort. It's though and though it's a bit less pleasant, we might even be willing to document the ways and times in which we respond poorly to people and to circumstances. It is as far it is a far more invasive and disruptive endeavor to pause long enough and dig deep enough to consider what we actually believe and how that belief shapes our dispositions and do respect directs our path. That process leaves a mark. Most of us aren't looking for an existential crisis, but let's be willing to have one, to admit our questions, inventory our struggles, 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 our struggles, and attend our burdens. You're likely to, you're likely having such a crisis, whether you acknowledge it or not. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. And since you are, you're probably in some form of deconstruction, reconstruction, or straight-up demolition of your former faith. You are in the emotional growing pains of adult spirituality. Reexamining your entire your entire image of God is going to be a bit of an interruption, something you can't numb with a stream, streaming binge or a couple hours of mindless slot machines strolling, scrolling through your news feed. When your previous understanding of whatever you imagine set life into motion and holds it all together and directs your movements, faces, 
disturbance, there are going to be consequences and costs and collateral damage. Many people don't want to do that invasive and comfortable work, which is why they are satisfied allowing someone else to tell them what, they, what to believe. I'm glad that, for whatever reason, you're not satisfied with that. Our world, starved for love, is glad too. So that was the end of the introduction. You had one job. Now it's time for chapter one, Unboxing God. Oh no, I'm trapped in these pants. That was the first thought I had as I careened wildly around my walk-in closet. It probably sounds as ridiculous to you now as it did in my head in that moment. The situation had deteriorated rapidly. rapidly. Just five minutes earlier, I'd been quietly thumbing through the outer reaches of my clothes rack, far from the well-traveled middle section, where outfits no longer suitable for respectable human beings languish for years in dust and darkness before finally being invicted into cardboard boxes or garbage bags and sentenced into to spend their remaining days in the attic or ga garage. As a series of once sensible and now tragically laughable fashion decisions slid past me, I stopped abruptly as I suddenly found myself face to face with a 30 year old friend, a pair of ladies' stretch denim paint pants I purchased in 1988 at the Cherry Hill Mall in southern New Jersey. Author's note I was 20 years old, had a long and luxurious mane of thick, naturally curly chestnut net. And as the male singer of in a local hair band, as they were fat. <sighs> Sorry about that. As they were affectionately known, there was absolutely nothing unusual about buying my clothes in a woman's clothing store. Yeah. As I star stared re reverently at the glorious acid-washed relic of my youth gone wild, suddenly a voice in my head that strongly resembled my own said, You know, I bet they still fit. Like the crafty serpent tempting Adam and Eve in the garden, the voice dared me forward. Go ahead, try them on. At 51 years old, I still consider myself in pretty good shape, so I answered back with a naive optimism. Why not? I was about to get a definite answer. Things started off promisingly enough. I bent down and grabbed the waistband, stepped into the leg holes that tr easily traveled my ankle, but by the time I reached my calves, I realized I was in trouble as process slowed sub substantially. Undaunted, I doubled my resolves and pressed on, which turned out to be a really terrible idea. I was soon wriggling wildly, and my breathing became noticeably labored as I tried to muscle myself all the way into what had quickly become a pair of bu pa pale blue human sausage casings. After when those efforts proved futile, I began to hop violently like a stationary sack race participant hoping the blunt force of gravity would thrust my thighs the rest of the way through the now obviously woefully undersized space provided. After four or five disparate heaves, I felt a rush of air suddenly vacuum sealing me in and mercifully came to rest on the ground. I stood there with my ch chest heaving and forehead perder perspiring as if I, having just completed high intensity cardio training and initially feeling pleased with myself. However, any satisfaction was only a momentary victory as I felt the elastic waistband sharply digging into my skin and my legs started to quickly lose feeling due to lack of blood, blood flow. I was then, it was then that I came to three sobering realizations. One, I was no longer 20 years old. Two, I still hadn't fully exhaled. Oh. Sorry, that means I'm almost done. So, it was then that I came to three sobering realizations. One, I was no longer 20 years old. Two, I still hadn't fully exhaled. And three, I wasn't getting out of these pants by myself. I think that's a cute spot. <laughs> cute. Yeah, it's a cute spot to end. Uh, for today, but I hope you guys had fun listening to If God is Love, then don't be a jerk and yeah, remember to say I love you to someone, anyone because you don't know that how much that can save a life. 
maybe a family member or maybe a friend or a boyfriend or a girlfriend or whoever. Anyways, um, have a good day, BB Swans, and I love you. Bye-bye.